Okay, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Um, we're in week 15 of ENM 2020. Uh, we had two talks this week, one from Jorge Soberon and one from Fernando Machado. Uh, we've been talking about accessible areas and BAM scenarios and things like that. Um, so we're going to jump into the questions. I'm going to share my screen so that you all can uh, see what, see where we are and what we're doing. Um, essentially, we're in this segment on distributional equilibrium. Uh, Jorge started it out with an overview, and then Fernando jumped right into uh, a novel methodology not yet published. Um, but I think pretty robust for, for estimating M. So that's the first week of this segment on distributional equilibrium. The second segment, and this is something that you all will recoil in horror from, is two talks on BAM and M and model success by me, uh, which is to say nobody else volunteered, so I ended up doing it. So if anybody wants to take a week off and avoid the, the horror of two talks from me, you're welcome to. Anyhow, um, we have the usual 200 or 300 questions. So Fernando and Jorge, what questions are particularly interesting? Many are very interesting. Well, which, with which one would you like to start? Just a sec. Um, that one in um, line 1984, I think. 1984. So, um, yeah, that's, um, I think um, the question is basically if the, um, it's necessary to do an M for each species that we're working with. And the answer is yes. Um, and that's part of the motivation that we're trying or we're developing this, this approach to um, accelerate the, um, the process. Because um, yes, you need, you need uh, a, an M for, for each species that you're working with. Uh, each species has different dispersal uh, capabilities or abilities and has uh, each species has a different history. So um, in some scenarios uh, where you have a uh, Wallachian species in, in an island, that might be a case where you can use um, the whole island, something like Madagascar uh, as an M, but in most cases, at least for, yeah, in most cases, I would say yes, you need an M for each species. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't use the word accelerate because these, um, these simulations can take a fair <laughs> amount of time. Um, yeah. My guess would be that people will actually come to hate this because it's going to slow things down. Uh, what it does do is it provides a quantitative basis for estimating M, whereas what we've been doing since publishing the Barve et al. paper in 2011, what we've been doing is just state explicit assumptions. You know, like we're going to assume that everything within 200 kilometers is accessible. Well, that may be reasonable and it may even be true, um, but it doesn't get us a robust, quantitative, replicable um, M hypothesis. And so what uh, Fernando and actually Marlon as well have developed is a methodology for estimation 
and it may well be that you know maybe on average it is 200 kilometers around the sites but it may be 400 kilometers in some directions and 10 kilometers in other directions so i, I think this is refining the idea of an m hypothesis uh, but it is going to be laborious and uh, time consuming to do the uh, the simulations yeah actually that was uh uh, some people ask how how much time does it take, and I would say for a species it, it depends on resolution and, and number of points and number of parameters that you want to uh, include. Um, but I would say an hour so for medium like small a small medium range, not that many points, not that many parameters. It could take more, like we. But but when you did each of the species that we're using as examples in the, the manuscript that's soon to be submitted on this topic, um, how much kind of total processing time did it take? I mean, not not in terms of improving and redoing and things like that, but more, you know with all the different experiments that we felt were necessary for each species, approximately how much time did each species take? Um, Marlon, would you say at least two weeks? I'd say one week for sure. Okay. I don't know if two weeks. Well, any- If, if we can see, yeah, uh, yeah, we, we did, uh, I would say, yeah, one week for, for four or five species with all the parameters we, we uh, try. <laughs> so if any of you have worked with um, molecular systematics uh, and, and fitting phylogenies to sequence data, um, there's, a, there's kind of a parallel step where what you have to do is estimate the evolutionary model that best works for your data set, you know, for that particular lineage and that particular gene uh, region and such. It's it's a model test is the is the program that most people use, and it's kind of on the same order of magnitude, where it's between hours and days of processing time to work through the data and essentially see which evolutionary model works best with that particular data set. And, you know, the molecular systematics people don't complain all that much about it. I mean, they complain when, they're, when their model test is running, but it's part of life for them. And what we've always done in niche modeling is just, you know, be really honest, a quick and dirty, um, here's an assumption about M. Is it robust? No. Uh, Jorge usually uses a, a fairly vulgar term that means by the seat of your pants. And um, not that Jorge is a vulgar person, but um, the expression that he uses is vulgar. Um, and that's the way we've been doing it, by the seat of our pants. And by the seat of your pants, Professor. Thank you, Jorge. <laughs> How about another question before we go further into Jorge's vocabulary? Uh, question um, 1985. There we go, right there. It's Why did you say that current distribution models overestimate yeah. the current distribution of an ENM is the actual distribution plus the potential new areas to be colonized with movement? So it is not an overestimate, it's just that people wrongly interpret it as if all areas were actual distribution, right? Correct. I, I don't say that models overestimate because in my mind, what a niche model projected into geography does is project uh, a potential area. So I don't see that's an overestimation. This has been going on for, since we started. And, and the reason why Town and I, um, draw the first BAM diagram was because we were discussing this problem of the overestimation. That was, what, 20 years ago, Town? Yeah. 20 yeah. years ago. So 
a, a few people for 22 years have known that niche models projected in geography do not overestimate. They, they are a hypothesis about suitability of, of, of environments, whatever variables you are using. But it's amazing that even today, I'm, I've been reviewing papers during this pandemic and, and, and we still see the term overestimation used to, to, to mean that, well, what the niche is in geography shows is different from what I suspect is the true in terms of the distribution. It's uh, the, the statement in that, in that question is perfectly correct is that people wrongly interpret as if all areas were distribution. Yeah, in fact, it was sitting around a, a computer in what is now Jorge's office, not where you see him right now, which is his dining room, um, that we were perpetually frustrated because we would fit a niche model for a species that was endemic to Mexico, and we would just always see distributional area south and east of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec um, going into Central America. And, you know, we had this, this quandary of, well, why do we always get these additional areas? Well, because we hadn't appreciated the difference between an actual distribution and a potential distribution. And that actually turned into a paper in science in 1999. That's true. So let me jump right down here uh, to Fernando. Are your tools already available for simulating accessible areas? Yeah, um, almost. They are, uh, I would say they are in beta version, but yeah, uh, I mean, the manuscript is in preparation. And a version of the of the R package is in GitHub. It's just we're doing final tests and like make making sure that everything is in order. But it will be it will be available soon. And uh, that that was a recurrent question. If if the code was available, it was gonna be it's gonna be available. It's gonna be open for everybody. It's going to be an R package. Um, and I didn't mention in the talk, but you don't need to know how to use Python. Uh, the, package, the package calls Python and runs a part of it uh, on that. So basically, you just need to install it in your computer. And so normal or uh, usual R package. Nothing to worry about. So for advanced or impatient uh, members of the class, um, the code in GitHub, is it open now? Okay, maybe you can chat me the, the uh, site, uh, but I would ask people not to inundate Fernando and Marlon with questions about it because they're writing the paper right now. Um, the the paper I think is probably between days and a couple of weeks away from submitting. Uh, it's it's in quite good shape. Um, Marlon and Fernando put a ton of work into it. Um, and actually, an interesting thing about that project is it all came from Fernando taking a Python programming course and looking for a semester project, and it evolved into this this pretty neat step forward in the field. Another question? There, there are a lot of like questions related to the parameters that you have to use for the end simulation. Uh, and that they are like good questions. It's okay to be worried about how to define the ability, dispersal ability of a species based on a dispersal kernel and its standard deviation. Those are good questions. Uh, and, and yes, it's difficult to do it because you don't have that kind of information for all species. Not all the species disperse the same way. Uh, and 
I think there is where the knowledge of the ecology and um, biological history of the species plays a major role. So doing this kind of mo M mo simulations is gonna be all about taking explicit uh, decisions and like, I mean, you have to take decisions, you have to, sorry, you have to make decisions, you have to be aware of the potential consequences and you have to be explicit when you say what you did so it can be reviewed correctly. There was a question that's related to, to your comment, uh, Marlon. Um, I think it's, yeah, 1973, the line. Um, it says, if we need to set a starting point to develop my M, but I don't know where the initial point can be, and this uh, alters, alters the result, do you recommend to do it anyway with a r random initial point? And when I was reading this question, I thought, is it possible to have multiple uh simulation so multiple random starting points and then compare the uh, final outcome of m uh, and basically test the sensitivity of the the result on the random the initial random points does it make sense to do that or it's not necessary it makes all the sense in the world You guys correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we're taking a random subsample of occurrence points available as starting points. Is that correct, guys? Yep. yep. Well, imagine, imagine, I don't know if you, Fernando, want, want to say this, but imagine, imagine that you have your current point, and since this uh, software allows you to go back and actually start your simulation back in a scenario that is past in the past period uh, only from only those records that are in suitable areas in that specific scenario you uh, take a sample and start the simulation with those and also the program does like replicates so it takes it does different steps every replicate and those add variability of course and that variability is not explicitly sensitivity of, uh, not explicitly like a way to measure sensitivity, but in some sense, it'll give you an idea of what's the effect of having this thing, uh, at least movements or, or directions of movements and stuff like that. So just a comment about using a package like this that, um, that requires inputs that you may not know much about. Um, <clears throat> in the old days when, a, when photography was uh, a little more cumbersome and a little more expensive, if the photographer didn't know the right light settings, they would always say, well, I think the right se light setting is this. And so I'm going to go, you know, one f-stop this side and one f-stop this side and one shutter speed this side and one shutter speed that side. It's called bracketing in photography. And the equivalent of that in, in modeling and simulation is this thing called sensitivity analysis. And so, you know, one of the inputs that you might have is, is characteristics of the dispersal kernel. Well, okay, you're studying some species where you have no idea what its dispersal characteristics are, then probably what you want to do is go from, you know, kind of ridiculously low to ridiculously high and then kind of reasonable but on the low side and reasonable but on the high side and then kind of right on. And what you want to do is obviously pay more attention to those reasonable numbers and less attention to the ridiculous numbers, but also you don't want to, um, you don't want to do things you don't want to use results that are specific to one set of parameters. You want to use results that are kind of general across those reasonable values of the parameters. Because no, we don't know the full dispersal kernel for more than a very, very few species and for maybe even not for those in the, in the, the biggest scales. 
So uh, you definitely want to bracket these values and do, you know, what's essentially a factorial experiment, you know, all values of dispersal and all values of such and such, but you want to explore parameter space and you want to find outcomes that are not terribly sensitive to particular values. Yeah, this is, um, the starting point is, it's an interesting uh, issue. And when I was thinking on uh, how to approach it, or how to address it, sorry, um, it took me a while before saying, well, yeah, like I, I, I think this question was related to a comment that uh, Jorge mentioned in his talk. Uh, when, when, um, depending on when this, where the simulation starts, uh, the result is really different. I was noticing that too. So, uh, what we did in um, the code web that we're presenting now was taking this uh, sub sample, this random sub sample, and do re replicates to try to summarize the results of all these different uh, potential M's. Uh, but I'm curious like on what, what Jorge think of, thinks about like uh, all this issue about starting points. It, uh, it's, it's really difficult to time travel to the past and, and, and like figure out where a species start. Let me make a comment on that, and mostly on the random initial point. Uh, as Fernando said, when you do a simulation uh, of uh, something that began as a, as, a, as a niche model, you have uh, probably often uh, spattering of uh, suitable places, maybe all over the world. If, you're, if, you're, if your canvas is the world, you are going to have points in South Africa, so I'm thinking of a real species, Lantana camera. Well, it, suitable areas occur in India, in Africa, in many parts of Latin America and other parts of Southeast Asia. And uh, where if you start in South Africa, well, you're going to end in South Africa. And if you start in India, you're going to end in India. But the plant is from Mesoamerica. So, it's not just a matter of randomly choosing a point. It would be, that would be a big mistake in my, in my perspective. You need to know something about the species. And, and there, there, right now there are few possibilities because there, are, there is not enough fossil data for most species in the world, maybe for mammals and maybe for some plants. But in, in the absence of that, what I suggest you do is begin when you want to begin say last glacial maximum project your niche there and choose a reasonable starting point for a simulation if you are to going to do it by simulation there are other ways of estimating m that do not require a simulation but if you are going to do it as, as by simulation which i think is a very promising uh, avenue for research uh, so either select your point from, from basic information about the biology, the past biology of the species, or uh, do some sort of reverse, uh, try to find which one is the likeliest given the distribution today, uh, which is something that no one has implemented in any software that I am aware of. Uh, Maybe Fernando and, and Marlon have already done that, but I, 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 I am not aware of that. So it, uh, selecting the initial condition is a crucial thing, absolutely a crucial thing. And it's not a problem that has been um, addressed by the community at large. There are a few pioneer efforts right now. Here's another way of thinking about the same question, and I think it's basically the same answer, but way back three, four years ago when, when Fernando was starting this project, um, I think his initial seeds for the simulation were single points. And what we found was that that yielded 
kind of starting ranges that tended to be a subset of the full range. And that's what led us to the current plan of um, take a random subsample of the occurrence points. Because basically the current range of a species, and I know we've got the problem of we're really starting the simulation in the past, but assuming that the current mimics uh, interglacial periods in the, in the Pleistocene, which is not an unreasonable um, uh, assumption. Let's, let's just breeze by that problem for right now. Um, the current distribution of a species reflects the species having overcome at least some of the dispersal barriers that it might have met up with in the past. And so um, I think you, you essentially save yourself a lot of what we would call burn-in uh, but you know, essentially allowing the species to come to distributional equilibrium before you start the interesting part of your simulation. Now, Jorge gave the example of Lantana camera, which is a species, yeah, native to Mesoamerica, but which has been transported worldwide, or at least subtropics worldwide, uh, by humans. And so you could start from a single point or start from their native range, its native range, but you would have to have included in that burn-in period, in that spread out to distributional equilibrium, uh, all of the vectors of dispersal. And some of those vectors of dispersal are uh, human movements, which are global. So I think probably more logical is just to include um, starting points from a broad sample of distributional areas around the world and essentially save yourself some tough burn-in time in the, in the simulation and get your simulation to a decent initial uh, starting point that pretty much mimics the current distribution. And I know, Lantana camera, we're not talking about glacial cycles. We're talking about um, a distributional history that is mainly post-glacial as far as its world range because it's it's all human mediated. So anyhow, just a, a thought that that seeding the distribution and that initial part of the simulation is about essentially reconstructing most of the current distribution. I, I think an important assumption of, of the approach is uh, niche conservatism. Um, and I might say that until when data, the time, the time traveling to the past would break when that as a, ascension breaks. So basically you can go, I mean, hypothetically, as far as the niche was conserved for each species. Uh, this, this issue of uh, centers of origin of species uh, uh, are, it's, it's, it has a long history in, in phylogenetics and biogeography and it's really hard to really know where a species started. So I guess at, at least my personal view of this, uh, how, how we're tackling this is basically saying, well, the species is already a thing. It's, it's already um, um, has some distribution and we are not necessarily uh, starting the simulation when the species started, but it's already uh, distributed in some part of the world. And we're assuming that part of the actual distribution covers what, what, what uh, that previous distribution was. Because as Marlon pointed out previously, <laughs> what we do is to see, well, from this uh, estimate of the fundamental niche we have, we project to the past, we see which areas were suitable in the past, and if there are uh, uh, present occurrences that coincide with those areas in the past where that could be a seed. And we do that with uh, 
uh, multiple times with replicates. So for now, we think works, but yeah, the, the, um, it's definitely uh, an issue that needs attention and needs, uh, we need to think a lot about it. Let's try this question that I have highlighted in, in yellow. Maybe it's, maybe it's overkill, but I think we've still got some confusion about what M is. So the question is, are occupation models a way to estimate M? Answer is no. Um, occupation models are a real interesting uh, analytical framework where you use repeated sampling of sites as a way of estimating the probability of actual presence. Um, but M is something very different. Occupation models might give you a refined view of the actual distribution of a species if you have good enough sampling across a broad enough area. But M is more than that. M is an area that would include the present distribution, but also all the sites that the species has uh, dispersed to and maybe not been able to colonize and, and persist. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's I, historical. So I think I think <laughs> someone was asking uh, if M was uh, a hypothesis or and I mean we ha we have Jorge and, and Town here. I think yeah you can elaborate on that, but. I would agree that, yeah, M would be every place that the species has access or visited. And it could have now or in the past uh, show suitable or unsuitable conditions. It's, it's about access and dispersal abilities more than actual distribution. Related to this conversation, there's a very short question on line 1980 that is, I think, interesting and it, helpful to clarify, like you said, on the uh, possible confusions uh, about M. Um, it says, can we indicate or simulate M by using environmental space? And my short answer would be that uh, M is about dispersal in geography, so I don't think we can do this in environmental space, but yeah, I, I thought it would be good to clarify this. That takes us back to the uh, Hutchinsonian duality. A species distribution is in geographic space, its niche is in an environmental space, and those two spaces have relationships among them but they're not simple and they're not um, direct. And so, no, I mean, explicitly we can't uh, use environmental space as a means of estimating M because M is about, one, it's, it's an area in geographic space, but its structure in environmental space is going to depend on uh, the, the, essentially the topology of the relationship between those two spaces. So in a place like, well, here in Kansas, uh, that relationship is a lot simpler than, let's say, in Ecuador or Venezuela. Um, and so, you know, here in Kansas in the Great Plains, a nearby site will tend to be nearby in environmental space as well. But in the Andes or in even in the Appalachians where Mona is, um, a nearby site may be very different in environmental dimensions. So um, no, M is a spatial phenomenon. Just want to I, I, I agree with that. Of course you can use environmental space to clarify what you are doing, but M is a thing of geography. And I just want to add that uh, environmental space, it's important in what Fernando is and I have been doing. 
because it allows you to see what are like the suitable conditions based on the simple fundamental estimate, uh, uh, simple estimation of the fundamental niche, and that restricts the, the dispersal of the species. So it's important, but it it restricts the dispersal of the species in the geographic space. Once that set of suitable conditions are projected to the geographic space. And there is where dispersal events can happen, not in the environmental space. Uh, I think there's a, a good question in uh, 1976. Uh, and it connects with uh, this. There's also, I mean, there's were some questions about if this that we're doing is um, circular or not, but I think uh, this question is good. Um, should I read it? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I got distracted for a moment. All right. So it says, um, I'm really interested in how to estimate M and I have a question. Um, if I understand correctly, the idea is to model M using a preliminary fundamental niche model and then seeing how the species will disperse from a starting point over a relevant period of time according to movement parameters and toward the distribution of the fundamental niche at each time period. If I got it right, then my question is, how do you find the fundamental niche before doing the simulation? So, yes, uh, and, and Marlon mentioned it briefly, we're doing, it's, it's uh, and this is mentioned also in, in uh, the Barbe uh, paper from 2011. It's a little bit, could be seen as circular because we're doing first an estimation of fundamental niche to estimate M, and then using that in uh, an ENM, but it's important to say here that an ENM doesn't estimate the fundamental niche, but something like um, the system niche or the realized niche, depending on the algorithm. Uh, what we're doing is take a really simple uh, approach that is con building an ellipsoid, uh, and we're assuming that the that the niche has a, an ellipsoidal shape, or basically that is that is um, that assumption is based on the idea that species have normal uh, responses to xenopoietic conditions. So in a multi-dimensional space, the niche would be um, uh, ellipsoidal. The, um, Jorge and Tan have a paper recently on the shape of fundamental niche. There are species that uh, don't have uh, a combat niche, probably, like migratory species, for example. Uh, but generally, we would say that the shape, it's as Hutchinson um, suggested back in the day. Uh, and what we're doing with that ellipsoid is trying to see in the uh, in different time periods or, or just in the present, which areas are inside that ellipsoid. Someone else asked what, uh, why uh, we were doing uh, a 95% or what was a 95% confidence uh, ellipsoid. Basically, we are just, it's, it's an statistical approach. We are trying to not include everything, uh, all the occurrences, that were given to to um, the code um, to do this ellipse because some uh, even though we we recommend that the occurrences that are included are already clean, some uh, some um, outliers can be uh, the result of, of sampling and cannot. Uh, maybe our sink populations, there are a lot of, as, as or, or our errors. Or our errors, like there are a lot of problems with samplings and occurrence data as, as uh, I think has so been I'm, covered before. I'm gonna take a little bit of issue with the idea that uh, of circularity. 
um, lots and lots of analytical procedures that we use begin with an initial estimation that might be crude or approximate, but it just gets us a start. Okay, think about priors in a Bayesian analysis. What we're doing here is we're saying, well, we're going to start with a reasonable uh, initial estimate and use it to get a better view of one crucial parameter, which is this, this accessible area. I know it's not a number, it's, a, it's an area and all of the environmental associations of that area. But I think using an initial approximation to get a better end approximation or end estimate is very common in, in data analysis in biology. And that, that's what we're doing. We're using the same data to posit a, an initial guess at the fundamental niche, use that to um, improve a parameter setting of the model, and then using the same data, we can now do a better job at estimating the niche. It's now, I think, I, sorry, Dan. I no, think it's important to say that the, the code can work if one already have uh, 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 an estimate, sorry, of the fundamental niche from other kind of data. So if you have physiological data and you have uh, uh, an estimate of the fundamental niche, you can build, you, you could build those suitability layers within this code uh, without uh, taking the approach of, uh, of a 95% confidence in uh, ellipsoid. It's just that most of species don't have that. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just a way to start. But as, as you say, it's a good guess. And, okay. and then just to come back to one other point, you said um, ENMs don't estimate the fundamental niche, but rather the existing niche. Um, I, I think that's something that is, um, is a point at which the, on, on which the field can and will evolve. Um, right now we use tools that tend to create a fairly compact and a fairly complex thing which I think indeed will frequently resemble the existing niche more than the fundamental. But of course, it, re it, it depends on the settings that you use. And we'll talk about model uh, fitting later on in the course. Um, but I think there's a, there's a frontier for the field, which is to make some crucial but reasonable biological assumptions like you know what shape should a fundamental niche have what sort of object should it be and fit explicitly things that have that shape and so later in the course jorge and a doctoral student of his laura jimenez are going to give a talk about um, fitting kind of a new class of uh, niche models that are explicitly responding to reasonable biological assumptions about shapes of fundamental niches. And I think, I think we're going to see a, a qualitative step forward when we, when we make those changes. Um, so I think, you know, which niche we are estimating kind of depends on a lot of assumptions and a lot of steps that we'll be specifying kind of from the week after next onward in this course. Well, let me, this is a very interesting topic, really interesting and very fundamental to what we do. Uh, the idea that fundamental niches have shapes like ellipsoids or boxes, as, as uh, Hutchinson suggested, it's essentially the idea that if you, if the environment is suitable between two point, in two points, the intermediate environments are also going to be suitable 
for a species. That's the core idea. And that is the idea of, of, of convexity. Uh, shape in multivariate space is convex if it has that property. Uh, so we are assuming that niche, um, fundamental niches have a convex shape. And uh, going a step beyond Hutchinson's that thought that they were little boxes, we are thinking they are like eggs with, with a direction and, and you can rotate the egg in different uh, directions and you will have a different niche. Uh, that is very reasonable. And, and a lot of people have used that assumption um, in the literature without even discussing it uh, since, since a classic paper about Maguire in the, in the 70s. Uh, so that's what Fernando is, is, is using and we are using very often and we are beginning to model uh, niches using ellipsoids rather than complicated shapes among other things, because they have a more reasonable biological meaning. A complicated shape is, is arbitrary, and, and I don't think in nature the fundamental niche would ever be rather com, uh, uh, concave with, with holes and gaps and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's unlikely that this is going to happen, but that's an empirical question. Now, second thing, when you do actually good go and look at the data, um, you will realize that if you estimate a fundamental niche using physiological data and a realized niche using um, presence absence points and you compare the two, uh, sometimes they are not that different. And that is a, a, a very sort of uh, encouraging result. Uh, that has been done in, 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 in uh, using using fundamental niches obtained from physiological data and, and realized niches you obtained from, from uh, occurrence data in geography. And the result is what I just said. There is not such a huge difference in the cases that have been um, studied empirically with data. And that's a paper by myself and, and, and Baruch Arroyo, uh, which is already out. So- um, And which I'll put up on the site. Um, yeah, I will, I will share it in a second. <clears throat> so, um, and by the way, that paper is based on, on niches on one dimension because the referees wouldn't allow us to do uh, two dimensions, but the results with two dimensions uh, using physiological data are basically the same. So it seems to me not to be such a, a, a weak result. It's an interesting result. So when we do say I'm accent and we get a realized niche, maybe we are not that far from the fundamental in given a number of caveats and assumptions that this is not the, the place to, to discuss. But um, sure, uh, simulations require fundamental niches and you need some sort of estimation of the fundamental niche and that is a research problem right now. I just, I just want to add that uh people may start thinking or may start ask, asking themselves, so why then using uh, ellipsoids for estimating M and then using Maxin or any other algorithm using that M to estimate again the niche? Well, uh, there is a good reason why. Uh, ellipsoids are simple forms and one of the main things they have is that they are uh, they have both of the sides from the center uh, equal. So they are symmetrical. And if you think in the response of a species to a variable like temperature, it's not probably going to be symmetrical from the uh, maximum performance point. So sometimes the maximum performance point goes closer to the highest temperatures inside the niche. And then if you have a good uh, assum first assumption of the niche, create the M, an M that is going to consider those potential limitations of environmental conditions for a species, but also the spaces that have unsuitable conditions close to that area based on these personal abilities that you give to the program, then you're gonna have a further modeling exercise that is going to allow you to fit uh, probably 
better shapes to those uh, variables, better responses. Uh, if you fit a, a GLM, it's going to be, it's not going to be necessarily symmetrical. It may give you a better shape of the curve. And still it's a model, but it's going to be a little bit different and it's going to be different than this first ellipsoid you have. Having that uh, kind of like good ideas of what are the responses you're going to get, it's, it's also a very good thing to have. And your models are going to be better in the sense that you understand what you're doing in the sense that you're giving uh, inputs that are relevant for calibration of those statistical approaches. Okay, well, thank you everybody for a good discussion. Um, I've got to teach at 10, so I'm going to sign off pretty soon, but uh, any last comments from anybody? There are a lot of questions that we didn't uh, answer, but okay. It's, this is a very rich topic and we are just uh, developing it. And, and you know, you're, you're all welcome to come back next week, even though um, I'm hogging the, the schedule for, for this coming week and we can, you know, continue the discussion. So anyhow, thank you all and um, we'll see everybody. I shared the paper down. Did I've, you see? Okay. I've got it. I've got it. I will put up the Barve paper that was kind of the root of the M work. I'll put up the um, the physiology and realized niches paper from Jorge and the GitHub link for um, for the Grinnell package, uh, which is the the M estimation package. And you should also add the Jacob Cooper's uh, paper where, where he estimated them for 300 species of birds. Uh, <laughs> got very interesting <laughs> results. Okay, I will. Um, that was definitely seat of the pants, but extremely well done. Very carefully done. And yeah, you're right. It makes a big difference. Okay, I will see you all next week, I hope. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.